My name is Casey Rohn with Montgomery Planning. Uh, I want to thank the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee for um, planning the call this afternoon to talk about this work and to Darcy Buckley and MCDOT for hosting the call. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here to talk about this. I really like um, working on the Rustic Roads plan. Um, it's been something that I've, I've worked on throughout the course of my sort of first years getting oriented here at the planning department. And I think it's been a really great opportunity for me to learn the, the history and the geography of Montgomery County. So it's, a, it's been fun to work on. Um, and I wanna also start right off the bat by recognizing that this work um, is a project of, of many people over many decades, um, but has really been driven by the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee members and um, the work of many colleagues in the planning department and at MCDOT, so who um, maybe you'll get a chance to hear from later in the talk. So today, My slide. Oh, there it goes. Okay, great. So I'm going to share a little bit about um, some of the work that has gone into the ongoing update to the Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan and specifically focused on the road histories. Um, I am the historic preservation uh, team member who's on the master planning team. So this work is going to focus on the history, um, but it's also going to talk about the methodology that's gone into the plan update. So you'll learn a little bit about the road histories, but also a little bit of our process that went into it. So today we're going to talk uh, a little bit about why we're interested in these roads, um, uh, talk about the ongoing um, update to the master plan and sort of the, the Rustic Roads program generally, um, talk about what the approach of the Historic Preservation Office has been throughout this work, a look at a couple roads of interest, um, and then wrap up with our next steps for the plan and some time at the end for Q&A. And before we get really into it, please know that the plan itself is still a work in progress. So some of the elements that you'll see in the slides represent draft versions of what may end up in the final document. And it's likely that some of that, um, some of the roads, the recommendations and the content that you see here could change um, because the plan is not yet complete. So why is the Historic Preservation Office interested in this plan? You know, isn't it a transportation plan? And in fact, you know, we really see the roads as important historic resources in and of themselves. Um, not only do they represent sort of tangible physical links to the past through their materials and their alignment and their relationship to the landscape, they also convey a great deal of information about the organization of our social and economic systems going back to some of the earliest recorded county history. Historic roads are also um, somewhat of a vulnerable resource because they have to function as part of our modern transportation system. And as development and traffic volumes have increased over time, there's been pressure to alter these roads, to widen them, to add curves and gutters, to narrow uh, or widen tight curves and to remove narrow bridges. And so as these roads are altered, our ability to experience their history can be lost. So I'm not planning to rehash the entire history of the Rustic Roads program today. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with it already. Um, and I'm really just gonna give a quick recap for anyone joining us who's not familiar with the program already. So efforts to, begin, efforts to protect the county's rural and rustic roads began in the 1980s. This was the same era that brought us the um, agricultural and rural open space uh, functional master plan and the ag reserve. So after several years of study, the County Council adopted a new section of county code in 1993 that established a rustic roads program. And it set up a way to designate those roads through the master plan process. Um, and the intent was to protect the historic and scenic roadways that reflect the agricultural character and rural origins of the county. And it also established the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee who are the driving force behind the program. So the Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan itself was adopted in December of 1996. And it recommended roads to be designated as rustic or exceptional rustic, which are those that meet a higher standard of importance and which would be more adversely impacted if altered. 
And the recommendations for whether roads are designated are based in a set of criteria that are outlined in county code. And those are shown here on the slide. And these are the same criteria that we're using today with the current update to make recommendations about new roads to be potentially included in the program. And so rustic roads when designated have to meet all of these criteria. Um, and you can see they're related to road use and traffic volume and safety, natural features and vistas. And note that both criteria one and four specifically call out historic features and landscapes as determining factors. So since the 96 plan, ongoing master plans have added new roads to the program and can continue to do so in the future. The scope of work for the current plan update was approved in 2020, um, by which time the uh, program included 99 rustic and exceptional rustic roads. Um, each road that goes into the master plan in gets a map, a list of significant features which should be protected from alteration, a road history, uh, and a driving experience that describes the, the route of the road and what you see along the way. For this plan update, our task was to assess um, and document 20 newly nominated roads and 29 roads which had been previously designated but were um, missing write-ups of their significant features, driving experience, and history. So that was our, our major task with this update. And as the historic preservation planner assigned to the update, I've been responsible for writing the new road histories and working with the master planning team and the advisory committee to develop the content for the new plan. Um, our approach to these histories has been influenced by a number of changes within the planning department and the field of history and historic preservation over the past you know, two plus decades. So, I'm gonna spend a little time discussing what has influenced our approach and why these histories may read a little differently than the histories previously written for the plan. So in the past 25 years, uh, a long time, our department has been continuously working on new area master plans that have recommended new roads for the program and designated new historic sites. Um, and done a lot of research during that time. And so that new information has informed the road histories. And we want those to bring in wherever possible the work that has come out of the Historic Preservation Office in particular. And in recent years, that's included subjects like um, women's history, African-American community building, um, civil rights history, and the fair housing business. So we wanna to try to bring all that new information in wherever it's relevant. Uh, for example, our office um, is in the process of researching the Edward U. Taylor School on White Ground Road for potential designation to the Master Plan for Historic Preservation. And the knowledge gained through that research can enhance our understanding of this road and the uh, sort of cultural landscape of African-American African educational history that exists along the road here. We also have a fairly recent burial sites program that didn't exist at the time of the original plan. Uh, so in 2017, Montgomery County adopted two new laws that protect and preserve cemetery and burial sites as important historic and cultural resources. Uh, and one of these laws requires um, the planning board to maintain an inventory of human burial sites in the county. And our office hired a new staff member, Brian Crane, to oversee that program. So he's been working since that time to update the historical and locational information about the several hundred burial sites that have already been identified in the county and to add new sites to the inventory as they're identified. Um, and this work has built on earlier cemetery inventory projects that began um, around 2004, conducted by Peerless Rockville, Historic Tacoma Inc., and the Coalition to Protect Maryland Burial Sites. Um, and then in 2018, a lot of these sites were surveyed by Montgomery Preservation Inc. And so now in the new plan, burial sites are identified as cultural and historic resources. So they're reflected on all of our maps. Um, and importantly, um, they're reflected in the narratives um, and the family and community history that they represent is really part of that history, uh, particularly where these cemeteries are prominently visible from the, the road. Uh, another um, change in the department has been um, that in recent years, we have adopted an equity agenda for planning. 
um, which in part recognizes the role that our plans and policies have played in perpetuating systemic racial inequity. And so there's a lot of work underway around this and the methodology for equity in master planning is still a work in progress. Um, we're committed to starting right away to address and mitigate past inequities and to build a more equitable future. And so for the field of historic preservation and the historic preservation office within the department, this means examining the ways in which the field has historically upheld um, histories and historic sites predominantly associated with white people and white men in particular. Um, and bringing forward the stories and sites and communities that have been left out. Um, so this involves both reflecting on work done in the past and making a concerted effort moving forward to develop more inclusive histories. So in a somewhat related effort, our office played an important part in the County Council's directive of June 2020 to conduct a comprehensive review of all county owned uh, street names and public facilities to determine those that were named for Confederate soldiers and uh, those who do not otherwise share the county's values. And so this project I has to date identified three streets and one park that were definitively named for nationally known Confederate soldiers. But importantly, it also generated an enormous amount of research into local Confederates, Confederate sympathizers, and slaveholders from the 1790s through the 1860s. And this research resulted in a preliminary list of 269 Confederate soldiers from Montgomery County, 5,826 local slaveholders, and the names of over 3,300 individuals who were enslaved here. And the use of these names to rename further streets or public facilities is yet to be determined. Uh, but this is really invaluable information for us to understand the landscape of the institution of slavery and of those who fought to uphold it. And so this information has really um, informed the new histories written for this plan and helped us um, evaluate where changes were needed to the existing histories to ensure that where these um, sites and individuals associated with them are discussed, that it's done in a way that um, acknowledges this difficult history. And more broadly, the field of history continues to evolve in ways that has changed the language that we use and the ways that we write. Um, and specifically related to this plan, the National Park Service um, has issued some guidance related um, to uh, the language of slavery and, and how we talk about that institution and the people involved in that system. And so they make some specific recommendations for updated terminology that centers the humanity and agency of enslaved uh, persons, that removes the uh, implication of criminality that comes with terms like uh, fugitive, um, that really rejects any language around the framework of ownership, and which avoids the use of euphemistic language when referring to slaveholders and, and sites of enslavement. And this may seem um, sort of trivial, but we believe that language matters and we want the work that's coming out of our office to reflect these best practices. Because of the age and the geography of many of the rustic roads, many of the road histories touch on the relationship between the road and the institution of slavery. And so while most of the effort that has gone into the plan update has been to develop the histories for the um, new roads and those lacking descriptions. We're also taking some time to review the existing language to bring it into line with current practice. And I'll give you just a couple of examples to illustrate what that looks like. So um, here's Montevideo Road. I want to first point out the map here. So this is a draft of the map as it's going to look in the plan itself. So this is really meant to be viewed on a page, not necessarily on a PowerPoint slide, but I wanted to include them um, in particular because each map that you'll see includes a location map. And if you look at that, you can see a blue asterisk that indicates the location of the road within Montgomery County in case you're not familiar with where it is. And so each map um, 
also includes, um, will include all of the surrounding historic resources, including burial sites, historic districts, cemeteries, and anything else that is important to call out when you're understanding the road. So um, this is Montevideo Road down near the Potomac. Um, this area includes many historic sites associated with the wealthy slaveholding Peter family, um, including Montevideo Road, um, for which the road is named, and an overseer's house associated with Montevideo. And in the original plan, um, the description stated that Montevideo is one of the finest examples of federal style architecture in the county, built circa 1830 by John Park Custis Peter, offspring of the prominent Georgetown family. The overseer's house was built for Montevideo. It displays fine workmanship of rough cut Seneca sandstone laid in regular courses. And so while this description is factually true, um, we wanna be a little more sensitive to the fact that we're talking about a site, um, particularly with the overseer's house, that's so clearly tied to oppression and harm. And that we're talking about a family that built their wealth and these fine buildings through the labor of individuals enslaved here. So this is an example of one that we'll want to update and contextualize a little bit more. Um, another example is Westerly Road, which runs west out of Poolsville. It passes master plan historic site Stony Castle, um, which is just to the north of the road. And the original um, description read, continuing westward, there is a view of Stony Castle, birthplace of Elijah Beers White, a Civil War military commander and local hero. And so this language, it aligns the fact that White was, White fought for the Confederacy. Um, he was a committed supporter of the institution of slavery, who not only fought against the United States and organized others to join him, but even prior to the Civil War, volunteered to fight against anti-slavery forces in Kansas in 1855. And so maybe we don't need to get into all of that in the road history, but we do want to take a slightly less laudatory tone when we're talking about a figure like this and not just gloss over the facts of his life. So this is another example today where we want to offer a little bit of additional context. On a sort of separate note, we also have existing road histories that touch on the legacy of the indigenous people who lived here prior to European colonization and displacement of native people. And so there are a number of documented archeological and burial sites near the rustic roads, um, particularly along the Potomac River that are associated with Native American people and communities. And so as we reviewed the existing language, we looked for references to Native American sites and artifacts to ensure that any locational information provided is general enough to protect the specific locations of these sensitive sites and not you know, point people directly to them. Uh, and in some cases, this data is um, redacted in the maps, which unfortunately means that you don't see these sites and communities reflected in the same way that you do uh, for more recent occupants. And I would say in general, that this is an area where we recognize we need to do better. Um, we need to improve our understanding of Native history so we can better understand and communicate it um, and the influence of, of that history on our landscape today, including on our roads. So that gives you an idea of the type of issues that we looked at with the existing histories. And so now let's turn to the future and look at some of the histories we've developed for the current update. So we'll start with Game Preserve Road near Gaithersburg, which was designated rustic in the 2010 Great Seneca Science Corridor Master Plan. But again, the plan didn't specify the road's significant features or provide a history or driving experience. So that's, that's what we've been doing. So here's Game Preserve Road heading north with Great Seneca Creek to the left. Um, this road was platted in two segments around 1885. Um, it was intended to improve public access for um, to Clopper Station on the B&O Railroad. And it first came north from the Germantown Road, which is Clopper Road, and then south from Frederick Road in 1886. And these roads were predated by a private road that already existed here to serve um, the farms and major residences in this area. And the, the 
public road then came in um, after the fact and replaced that. And this is a community that had been shaped by the influence of um, France, wealth, wealthy property owner, Francis Clopper seen here at the right. Um, and within Seneca Creek State Park, you can find the ruins of Clopper's Mill, which was a prosperous mill first, first built in the late 18th century and then which Clopper came in and modernized um, by 1834. And so Clopper, he donated land for the railroad station and for the St. Rose of Lima Catholic Church and Cemetery, which is, um, was built in 1838 and then rebuilt in 1883. Um, this is a site that is both on our master plan for historic preservation and documented in the burial sites inventory. And when it comes to the history of this road, we want to recognize the fact that um, the wealth that Clopper's family enjoyed that allowed him to establish these community institutions and influence the development of the railroad. Um, all of this was built on wealth that came through work that was done by individuals he held in slavery. Um, you can see here in 1850, he held um, 25 people in slavery who ranged in age from a, a 68 year old man to a boy and uh, two girls only three months old. And so this road history acknowledges the role that these individuals played in building the local economy that allowed this place and ultimately this road to develop. This road also gave us the opportunity to highlight some uh, really cool women's history, which was definitely an underrepresented element uh, in the histories we had so far and in the field generally. Um, so Game Preserve Road is associated with two prominent women conservationists, uh, Emma T. Strider and Emma Jane King. Uh, Emma Strider made a, she was a wealthy resident of Washington, D.C., and she made a significant gift of land that helped establish the Strider Wildlife Management Area and lead to the development of the Seneca Creek State Park. And Emma Jane King was a lifelong conservationist who was born in Clarksburg in 1890. She's seen here at the left. In 1922, when she was only 32 years old, she began working as a caretaker for a private fish and game club established in this area. And then when the land was donated to the state of Maryland in 1927, she stayed on and was officially sworn in as a game warden. Um, she went on to serve in that role for the next 33 years and then a further 10 years as a volunteer. So her legacy is, is really tied to this road and this place. Um, here's her home uh, where she lived at 11131 Game Preserve Road. Um, she started here as caretaker and lived here during her time as game warden. She also raised um, here her son Malcolm, who went on to become himself a noted conservationist and um, who worked for the State Department of Natural Resources. Um, this home is part of the state's resident curatorship program today. Uh, Game Preserve Road also enjoys some notoriety for a historic ghost story uh, that dates to the 19th century. The road uh, passes under this circa 1906 railroad overpass. And in 1876, the Montgomery County Sentinel first began reporting um, some mysterious paranormal activity at the nearby railroad bridge, um, where people reported seeing strange flashing lights in the dark. And since that time, people have continued to sort of experience and describe strange uh, phenomena occurring around this, um, this railroad passage. So while we can't confirm a ghost story, um, we did find a place for this in the road history because this has been part of the oral tradition of this road since the 19th century. So next we'll take a look at Batson Road. Um, this is near Spencerville and it was designated rustic in the 97 Cloverly Master Plan, but again, missing those important details. So here's Batson Road looking, uh, it's, you're sort of at the north end looking back south um, and you can see where it is uh, starting to slope uphill. And in fact, Batson Road uh, really closely follows its historic alignment down to the Patuxent River. It was first planted in 1874 and built by 1879 to connect Spencerville and nearby properties across the Patuxent River into Howard County. There was a ford at the end of the road on the Murphy family property. 
And so if you turn around and face the other way from where that photo was taken, you can see that the road is blocked off there, but it did originally stretch through the trees and across the river. This road um, was a really great example of the extremely valuable information that you can find in the original road surveys and plats, which were recorded by the surveyors who went out to chart the course for these new roads. Um, and so these road plats are found in the county land records held at the Maryland State Archives, and they have an incredible amount of information. So they record the dates when the roads were first proposed and surveyed. And then in order to build a new public road, the surveyors had to find uh, and demonstrate a public purpose for the road to be built, not just one, one property owner saying he wanted a road. They had to say it would serve the public interest. So typically, um, these documents contain a, a reason, a statement of what that public purpose is. Um, so here they reported that we give the following among many reasons, the number of uh, farms and lots having no public outlet onto the Laurel Road, their most direct road to Washington, Laurel, Baltimore Mills, churches, and said road will also greatly facilitate travel between Montgomery and Howard County and will be a decided improvement of great public convenience. And so I think those are great, very useful information for writing these road histories. Um, these records also typically provide a list of the property owners whose land uh, the road would pass through and the compensation due to them. And if you're lucky, there will also be a map. Um, so here in the list of property owners at the bottom left, um, you can see that there are a number of individuals identified as well as the trustees of the colored church, which you can also find on the map. So this really caught my interest. When you check these names of property owners against the 1870 census, it shows that many of those who provided the land for the road were black property owners, uh, men who farmed and women who worked inside and outside the home. Um, and these families represented um, a free black community that was established here by 1865. Um, and all of this information together shows that by the time of the road survey, there were a number of African American families living uh, throughout this area and as indicated in the plat, an established church. George L. Bowen, who's listed at the top of the census page here, he had recently given some of his land for the establishment of the Mount Calvary African Union First Colored Methodist Protestant Church, which was first established in 1872 um, as a frame meeting house across the road from this site, which was destroyed by fire in the 1950s and then replaced by this structure. This road was also a good opportunity to make a connection with the burial sites program um, that has recorded the historic cemetery at the Mount Calvary Church, as well as a small family cemetery slightly further up the road. Um, and there's not currently a standing structure on the second uh, family cemetery site, so there's a lot less um, available information about it. So when um, Montgomery Preservation Inc. inventoried this site in 2018, they found this one gravestone here with the initials MEF, and they proposed that this could be the grave of Mary E. Franklin. And so the inventory noted that Mary Franklin doesn't appear in the census after 1880s, suggesting she had passed away. Um, and now with this road plat, we can say with greater certainty where the Franklin uh, family property was along the road and give further support to the theory that this was in fact the grave of Mary Franklin. So the rustic road designation here gives us the opportunity to bring together this history of the church um, and the burial sites and the land ownership um, to bring all of this forward and to recognize the black community that shaped the creation and evolution of this road. Um, this, so the next road we'll look at is Holsey Road near Damascus. Um, this is a nominee rustic road that's not yet part of the program. Uh, and this is a view towards the end of Holsey Road looking back east towards the proposed rustic section. So Holsey Road is significant in part as um, the site of 9342 Holsey Road. Um, this was the home of the late Inez Ziegler Maccabee, 
who was a longtime civil rights activist in the Damascus area who purchased this home in 1943. Her home is listed to the um, county's locational atlas and index of historic sites, and it's the only recognized historic resource on this road. Uh, while she lived here, uh, Inez Maccabee was a dedicated community activist. She established the Homemakers Club of Damascus, which was the first up-county organization for African-American women. And she contributed to the desegregation of public and community institutions in the Damascus area. Wow. When she purchased the home, she bought it from members of the Holsey family to whom she was related through her great grandfather and grandmother, Richard and Mahala Holsey. And the Holsey family um, descendants, they trace their ancestry here back to the early to mid 19th century, uh, when tradition holds that Holsey Road began as a path to the nearby Malinix plantation, and that many of the um, people who first settled here had been formerly enslaved at that plantation. So the house and this house uh, itself may have been built as early as the 1830s as a log dwelling that was expanded and modernized over time. So if uh, Holsey Road is designated as rustic, it will give us the opportunity to bring further recognition to this long oral history of the road that we have here. Um, but it will also further amplify the significance of this home as a historic site. And it will bring really underrepresented elements of women's history and civil rights history into the rustic roads plan. So the next road we'll take a look at is Haviland Mill Road. Um, this was designated rustic in the 1998 Sandy Spring Ashton Master Plan. Um, so this is another beautiful road established in the 19th century. Um, this, uh, the current alignment of this road is actually um, composed of two roads that were platted several years apart in the mid 19th century. So the northeastern segment was laid out in 1853 um, for the purpose of enhancing public access to Thomas Lee's mill and a nearby ford at the Patuxent. And it, so it opened a more convenient route to Baltimore for the individuals and farmers and millers in this area. And it ran north of the Hollings River and it went all the way across the parkland um, and connected to what is today windswept lane. Uh, and I'll show you that on a map in a second so you can get a better sense of that. Um, so, but importantly, as laid out for Thomas Lee's mill, um, he produced flour, meal, and feed there. Uh, but by the early 20th century, Merritt and Lydia Haviland had assumed its operation and that's um, where we get the name for the road today. So that was the first segment. And then in 1860, a new road was platted that branched across the Hollings River, which created the alignment that we have today. So if you put both of these pieces together, you can see how the 1853 segment ran all the way across the Patuxent River State Park. Um, that connection has now been broken and the route now takes that um, turn and crosses the Hollings River. And if you stand um, right where these two um, segments intersect, and you can actually see the original alignment of the road where it stretched across to present day windswept lane. And on the hill to the right there is the uh, circa 1865 George L. Stabler farmhouse, which isn't a designated historic resource, but it does date roughly to the time of the road's construction. So I think that's a really cool um, site to see if you ever, um, take a drive out to this road. So for this road history, you know, Thomas Lee and the mill were important um, because their, you know, their work was the reason the road was established, but it also gave us the opportunity to recognize um, his mother, Elizabeth Ellicott Lee, who with her husband, Thomas, settled in nearby master plan historic site, Walnut Hill in 1823. And while living there, she published Domestic Cookery, um, Useful Receipts, and Hints to Young Housekeepers, which was a very popular book of recipes and home remedies that went through a well over a dozen editions. And she, she was interested in teaching young women who were starting out um, the things that she hadn't known herself, like how to cook a pot pie or how to make a mattress, um, waterproofing shoes, and how to treat minor injuries and ailments like sprains and bee stings. So this was a really significant work that deserves recognition. 
Elizabeth Ellicott Lee, along with many other Lee family members and Haviland family members, she's buried in the Woodside Cemetery, um, which is along Haviland Mill Road. So this was another example of where our understanding of this burial site is enhanced by the road history and vice versa. So the last road I want to highlight is Frederick Road um, through Hyattstown. It was designated rustic in the 1994 Clarksburg Master Plan and Hyattstown Special Study Area. So this is one of the oldest roads in Montgomery County. Um, it was established by the mid 1700s as an important trade route between Georgetown and expanding colonial settlements to the West. The Maryland General Assembly first ordered its establishment as a public road in November of 1790, and it was platted by 1795. So this is a long road with a very long history, uh, but we're just going to focus on the rustic segment, which runs through the Hyattstown Historic District, which was designated to the Master Plan for Historic Preservation in 1986. So the historic district, um, it derives its significance from Hyattstown's history as a well-preserved early roadside town. Uh, the town itself was first laid out in 1798 by Jesse Hyatt, who was a wealthy landowner and slaveholder from Frederick County. Um, and you can, at the bottom right there, the circa 1810 to 1815 Davis House is an individually designated master plan historic site that is a rare surviving example of a brick federal style building in this part of the county. So that era and that history is the basis for the historic district significance, but the road's existence as a major thoroughfare um, has brought other interesting uh, travel through the town. And so one history that uh, is connected to the road that I wanted to highlight was the passage of Coxey's army in 1894. So these were anti-poverty demonstrators led by Joseph Coxey, who set out from Ohio and marched to the U.S. Capitol to protest um, very high um, unemployment and income inequality that followed the economic panic of 1893. Um, Coxie called for uh, what was a revolutionary idea at the time. He called for the government to adopt a good roads program, a federal jobs program that would put people to work in building out the nation's infrastructure. You can see the, the poor condition of the road here that they walked on. Um, and at the bottom right of this card, um, they captioned what I imagine was some sort of chant they were doing, more money, less misery, good roads. Uh, this action was uh, is thought of as a first significant protest march on Washington, and their route from Ohio to the Capitol led them right down the Frederick Road through Hyattstown, uh, where they camped in late April of 1894. And so the Baltimore Sun reported on the excitement around their arrival and also the apparent frustration of these marchers of having to pass through a dry county at the end of their very long march. Um, so we've been making an effort in our office to highlight some of the county's history of social and political activism, including the women's suffrage movement and the movement for LGBTQ equality. So this anti-poverty demonstration was definitely something I wanted to call out in our road history. So that's the end of the roads uh, we're gonna talk about today. Um, I do wanna share a little bit about our next steps for the plan itself. Uh, in the coming months, we'll be bringing the staff draft to the planning board and there'll be numerous opportunities for public comment um, and feedback and interaction as we move through these next steps. Uh, following planning board adoption, it will then move to the county council where there would be uh, further opportunities for you to share your feedback and input, and I hope you, that you do. Um, you can keep an eye on our website at www.montgomeryplanning.org slash rustic roads. Uh, we'll be posting status updates on the plan um, and ways to participate as we move forward into um, some of those opportunities for public participation. Um, I also hope that you'll continue to follow the work of the Historic Preservation Office because we have a number of really cool projects underway too. Um, we have our first historic district designation in some time uh, for a modernist district called Potomac Overlook. 
that's coming to a public hearing at the County Council on March 28th. And we also have research and designation projects that are exploring the history of LGBTQ people and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. And we're exploring um, the county's uh, history of the use of racially restrictive covenants through our segregation mapping project. So we have a lot of work underway to continue to enhance our understanding of county history. And I really hope that you'll engage with us on some of that work as well. Uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and thank you for your time listening to me so far and um, thank everyone else whose work has contributed to this program and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that have come up. Thank you. If you have a question, you can um, use the raise hand feature or you can um, go ahead and unmute yourself and speak or you can also write it in the chat box um, if you go to the bottom of your screen um, and hover over the it'll pop up. So it looks like we have a couple questions. We'll go um, start with Eileen and then Susan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, great presentation, Casey. Um, I, I love the way that all the um, all the components that have, that have been gathering for the last 50 years in, at Montgomery Planning are, are coming together. Um, one piece I didn't see and I wanted to ask about, and those are bridges. I saw the arch picture, but how about the bridges that um, are, are constantly being um, complained about, um, planned for updating and grading and so on, and, and where do they fit into this and how can we preserve those as well? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, I mean, obviously those have come up quite a bit as we've gone through this process and are a very important resource that are greatly relevant to, um, to the integrity of these roads. We have both um, also on this call, several of our other planners um, who have been involved in this effort. And I wonder if Jamie or Roberta, you might speak to the fact um, about these bridges being incorporated into the list of significant features. Um, in some cases where the bridges, um, I think were not previously identified as significant features, they are proposed to be added, which means that they'll be identified as a, um, a resource and, important, and an important feature of the road that should be protected. Um, Jamie or Roberta, do you wanna chime in anything? Further on that? Well, no, I mean, we, we have gotten a list of recommendations um, to add most of the bridges along the rustic roads to the significant features, but we haven't actually finalized our decisions on which ones will become significant features. So that's something we're working on in the next month or so. Right, we're in the process. Um, I do want to say that in the earlier plan, there's only a few that are listed as significant, and it's generally because of something within the design of the bridge itself seems worth preserving, like the, the rails along the side or, or the very architecture of the bridge might be something significant, whereas some seem more like culverts, and um, the appearance of them may not be the part that needs to be preserved so much. Okay, Susan, do you wanna ask your question? Yes, first I, I wanted, oh, I, I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. Very well, uh, well researched and inspiring for some of us in, in distant counties. Um, my question has to do with when um, roads are coming into the program, what kind of incentives for property owners are out there? Are there, um, you know, uh, tax incentives or or other things besides those beautiful road signs, um, which are an incentive by themselves? But um, just uh, uh, that, and also, do property owners have um, a say in pulling a road out of the program? That's what we're dealing with in Frederick County: is is property owners. 
I'm not, I'm trying to unmute myself. So I'm not aware of any specific financial incentive that would come to property owners along the roadway. Um, we do have a historic preservation tax credit for um, master plan historic sites in the county, um, which we do have one uh, exceptional rustic road that is also designated as a master plan historic site. Um, but I don't think there are any other specific incentives available. Um, we do have, obviously, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee uh, is meant to serve as representatives of the um, citizens and property owners along the road. Um, so they are sort of serving as the voice for um, some of those individuals. But we also have... Um, like, you know, as I mentioned, there are going to be a number of opportunities for public comment. So if people are interested in speaking up either for or against the designation of a road as rustic, or if they would like to advocate that a road be, you know, added to or removed from the program, they will have the opportunity to do that. Um, both through our feedback map, which is available now online, and then through this, um, through these many public hearings that are, are going to be upcoming for the plan. So I think there will be multiple opportunities for people to make their opinions known. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like there's a question in the comments. Um, Someone wrote, uh, do you have a way to remove the rustic road designation if that road was widened or changed? Yeah, so I think it's the same um, same idea, basically. Um, the plan, uh, the current plan update is going to um, make recommendations about the status of all of these roads, whether it's to keep that or add new roads to the program. So if somebody is interested in removing the designation, um, they can express that opinion to us as the staff and to the planning board and the county council and, and share that opinion and, and reason why they think it should be removed from the program. So it, it is possible. Along those same lines, um, a question, if, um, if people want to share their roads history, um, should they contact you? Yeah, I would love for people to um, contact me. I think um, obviously we have the set of roads that we're looking at now, we've looked at in the past, but um, this is a program that we'll, you know, we'll continue to consider in the future. So if you have a road in Montgomery County that you think has a really interesting history, please do share it with us because we have the opportunity to you know, continue doing this again in the future. So I'll, I'll, put, I'll put my uh, info in the chat here. That'd be great. And then I'll note that Jamie added, um, put a link to the, the master plan website for the, for rustic roads. And that is where the draft um, plan will, uh, will appear um, when it, it becomes available to answer an earlier question. Mm -hmm. Anybody else feel free to unmute, raise your hand or type a question in the chat. Got another question. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, what what role does do um, DPW um, and um, I think it's um, the CNO Canal, or the the Park Service. What roles do they have in this program? Jamie, Roberto, would you like to speak to DPW in particular? I don't think. Oh, were you speaking? I'm done. Uh, DPW as in the DOT, I, I would think Darcy would be an excellent okay. person to answer that one. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so we have, we have, um, so we're, our DOT is rather than DPW, um, but we provide, um, provide maintenance for all of our roads and rebuild our roads and um, do things like repaving or fixing potholes. Um, trees along the road. So there's a special consideration um, given in terms of maintenance activities for the rustic roads. For example, um, as you saw in many of the pictures, some places there are beautiful trees um, or flowers planted along it. Um, and so our, our, arbor, our arbor division knows that and, um, and they take 
um, care with them. They've worked closely with the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee to come up with kind of guidelines that are agreeable to everyone in terms of um, how to treat some of the plants um, along the roads so that they're so that they'll be there, you know, for years to come to avoid activities like clear cutting. So they're in, in lots of ways. Um, Thank you. That's great. And to answer the second any... part of your question, Susan, I don't think we have any special relationship with the Park Service. Obviously, a lot of these roads um, are in um, and adjacent to um, the parkland and um, are in National Register Historic Districts. Um, but I don't think we've had any special, um, like, I don't think any of them are park roads themselves. And maybe one of the other team members can correct me if I'm wrong about that. We're working with them. Um, Leslie, you know, maybe someone else could talk about, we did a site visit recently with um, mm -hmm. the parks department out on um, the details are allowed to me right now, but um, Leslie, do you want to fill into what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Can you remind me which site? Which site is it? The one where they're going to make they're going to make the parking lot um, a little bigger because there's state money to uh, the restore and make a new trail to that historic property. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, thank you, Rara. Um, yes, uh, the committee has traditionally had um, working relationships with. Uh, the National Park Service for the CNO. Unfortunately, um, after the retirement of the superintendent down there, I'm not sure there has been current communication. Uh, Darcy's referring to uh, DNR with the Patuxent River State Park. We're working with them on uh, a really fun project, as Jane said, on Elton Farm Road. And um, I think there are three um, county parks, par roads that are in county parks. And uh, traditionally the um, parks department has been terrific consulting with the committee on a variety of things there. Um, there's actually in county law, um, a recommendation for working with the parks departments. And I, I would just echo that and say our colleagues in parks have been very helpful throughout this process. They also have a number of um, parks, cultural resources um, near and along these roads that they've been very helpful and informative about. Susie, are you... Um, it, did that hit the points of your question? It did. Thank you, Leslie, and, and thank you, Jamie. Uh, um, and, yeah. and one more thing to add to that is as part of our update, we are adding parks information to what we're calling an environment section. Uh, so anytime a road runs next to or through a park, we're calling that out in the plan so that it's a little more obvious and all the maps show all of the parks as well. Is there a schedule for the publication of this plan? So, um, yes, we, we are working towards a briefing, which we hope to give to the planning board in April. Um, and then very soon after that, uh, by late May or June, we hope to have a working draft that we are taking to the planning board to begin uh, the work session and other uh, parts of the process to get the plan approved and to the county council. Casey, can I um, ask a question? You You're talked next. Brief briefly about um, uh, the uh, road issues with Confederate soldiers and stuff. Um, many of the rustic roads uh, are named for um, Confederate, um, everything, slaveholders, et cetera. Do you expect at this point to be looking down at these small individual roads? It seems like right now everything's operating at a much higher level. Yeah, I would agree with that. So 
the process, I think the project was meant to maybe have a phased approach. So the only roads um, that had been park trail that have been addressed so far were ones that were identified with these, you know, prominent nationally known um, Confederate soldiers. And the rest of the list of names that we have, um, we see as preliminary um, and needing, you know, further corroboration before we definitively identify any additional roads as being named for a particular person. Because, you know, as you know, many of these families were extremely, you know, prolific and long uh, lived and held properties throughout the county. So it's difficult to say at this point without further research, you know, for many of these roads to say specifically who a road was named for. And that's sort of where that project is for now. Now, if we hear, um, you know, if we are asked to, you know, take that project further and identify specific roads, I think we, we will be taking a look at many of these roads um, because of just because of the history and geography here. It is likely that some of them are, in fact, named for these individuals. So we'll know that these are ones we need to look at. But that um, there's not currently any ongoing um, action with that that I'm aware of. Um, you know, some of these decisions are going on above my level. So it's possible that there, um, you know, maybe conversations underway, but none that I'm a part of uh, about continuing that process at this time. However, we do have that, um, all of that information that we can use um, going forward, should we need to. Fantastic. Um, there was a comment in the chat from, or a question from Eileen about um, um, tours of rustic roads. And Roberto has commented about Heritage Montgomery working on um, a pamphlet for a tour. There are actually um, a series of uh, tours that are in process. And uh, Roberto has been kind enough to help with the mapping on that. So we'll be pestering him quite a bit, but hopefully um, there will be some very nice uh, brochures coming out for that. And I wanna give a shout out to uh, Frederick County and their rural Friends of Rural Roads group because they're the ones who originally did tours and the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee got very excited about that. And uh, that's kind of where that project started. And now I'm going to mute myself. Thanks, Leslie. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and of Casey's time. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, on behalf of myself and also I know uh, the Rustic Roads uh, Advisory Committee. And um, I think you, pro you provided your contact information in the chat. So, and do you want to say something before we go? No, I meant to click on clapping hands. But <laughs> it's beautiful. Beautiful. Excellent. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Yeah, very Bye, well everyone. done. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Casey. Yep. Take care. Bye.